Hello, good morning, and thank you for joining this Safety Culture World Webinar titled Bringing Everyone Along, Managing a Safety Improvement Journey Across Multiple Locations. I'm Abby Fansler with Caterpillar Safety Services, and I will be facilitating today's event. Before I introduce our presenters, I have a couple of announcements. First, all participant phone lines are muted, but I do encourage you to submit your questions and any comments about the material. You may do so by using the chat or the Q&A sections of WebEx. We will use the final 10 to 15 minutes today for Q&A. And also, this event is being recorded. The recording and a PDF version of the slide deck will be posted to safety.cat.com later today. You will receive an email notification once those materials have been uploaded. Now, I am pleased to introduce our presenters. Zach Knoop is a safety professional with more than 12 years of experience in the fields of street and highway construction, construction materials, and mining. As a director of corporate safety for a Fortune 500 company, Zach championed a, a successful safety culture change initiative that included management and leadership training, safety perception surveys, and the development of safety accountability systems. Now, for Caterpillar Safety Services, Zach engages with customers to coach leaders, train supervisors, and empower employees to build sustainable safety culture excellence. And Tim Ranson is the health and safety manager for the Cat Rental Store, a thinning Canada company based in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. During the course of addressing business safety strategies in recent years, Tim has focused on integrating a culture of safety within the rental business. He developed and introduced key safety programs for delivery drivers and new entry level employees to the rental industry. Under his leadership, the Cat Rental Store is currently engaged in Caterpillar's zero incident performance process. And with that, I will hand it over to Zach and Tim. All right. Thank you, Abby. Um, good day to everybody. And uh, really appreciate you all uh, joining us for this uh, hour-long webinar. And Tim and I are going to be sharing some of our experiences uh, that we've been through in managing safety across, you know, multiple locations, some of the challenges, some of the successes, and sharing some of the best practices. So um, thank you once again. Thank you, everyone. So our agenda uh, for the next 45 minutes, uh, this is what it's going to look like. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the uh, organizations that um, uh, either that, you know, we used to work for or currently work for give you a little level set about you know what they look like, uh, what those organizations, how they're spread out geographically. We're going to be talking about some of the traditional approaches to managing safety and, and why those approaches tend to not be very effective in driving safety performance. We're also going to be exploring some of the challenges that uh, companies face when it comes to managing safety uh, across multiple locations. And then we'll really get into you know what works some of the cultural models that deliver safety excellence, um, some specific examples that uh, Tim and I can share in regards to that, and then some of the best practices and lessons learned. So we'll start by just introducing uh, the company that I, I used to work for, as Abby kind of uh, introduced. Um, I was the corporate safety director for a large construction materials and heavy civil contractor, uh, ready mix, uh, hot mix asphalt, uh, street, highway, uh, road, um, contractor. A very large organization. You can see, you know, one of the largest producers of sand and gravel in the United States. Uh, this organization uh, really entered into a significant growth uh, phase starting in uh, 1992 and over the course of the next 20 years uh, acquired more than 60 companies. Um, as well as, you know, doing a lot of um, organic growth, establishing uh, themselves in new markets. So with that comes obviously a lot of challenges in managing safety. And geographically, you know, very uh, spread out uh, throughout the United States. And you can see the scope of the, the size of the company, you know, 5,000 plus employees. You know, looking at it from a, you know, map, uh, you can see the, the states that uh, this organization uh, you know, currently works in. And so when you think about managing safety, uh, it, it tends to get uh, a little overwhelming. Uh, corporate headquarters, you know, this was a company that uh, 
it was very decentralized in about 2005 started to centralize uh, much of its business functions including safety and so I went from a decentralized company to more of a centralized and we'll talk a little bit about uh, some of those challenges there. And Tim, talk a little bit about uh, the cat rental store. Thank you. Um, yeah, the cat rental store uh, is a, a standalone business unit within the Finning Canada organization and uh, we we are a full line rental house uh, providing everything from cat equipment obviously to uh, allied equipment, aerial work platform, um, heat, light, uh, power systems, uh, generation, power generation, as well as general construction tooling and industrial uh, shutdown material equipment. And as, as a uh, uh, fairly well-developed business, um, the grassroots of the business started with acquisition uh, back in 2000, 2001 of a couple of smaller rental houses, and we've grown uh, through that that process, both with uh, acquisition and with a few green start uh, uh, business setups in various centers. We're now located in uh, 28 locations with additional resources through our, our shutdown business um, using temporary tool cribs and uh, and trailers and on site for tool crib use. Most of the uh, employee base uh, are directly involved with Frontline. Our, our administrative support services is about 35 people and the rest of the employee base are, are in the front line throughout these locations in Alberta and BC. Um, having said that, our largest single uh, detriment to safety as it stands is the geography and the amount of time that our employees are working um, either on a job site at a customer location or traveling to and from a location. We'll talk a little more on that as we go through the process. Back to you. Well, I'll, I'll turn it right back to you, Tim. You can describe kind of the your lagging indicators uh, journey and, and why you've um, seen some success over the past uh, three, four years. Thank you. Well, we've had, um, we've had a couple of uh, epiphany moments, and, and in 2007 was one of the key. As you can see there, we, we had a total recordable rate that spiked at uh, uh, 7.02, and at that point, we, you know, we had some major concern about what was going on in the marketplace. Uh, just leading up to that, 2006 and 2007 were very aggressive years in terms of business and the demands on our business in our various uh, locations. We were we were experiencing uh, uh, high utilization, high throughput on on rental product, which put a, a significant demand on our staffing. The other concern that hit us in this market, as many of you may be aware, um, we're a, a fairly industrialized market with the oil sands in Alberta and some of the mining environments in BC and Alberta. And that uh, uh, put us behind the eight ball in terms of our staffing. And we were, we were aggressively looking for staff to fill primarily entry level positions, uh, drivers, delivery drivers, yard hands, um, wash bay attendants, and to a lesser degree, some of the shipping receiving duties and so forth. Uh, in a smaller branch where you have eight or ten people, uh, if your optimum staffing is ten people and you're continually trying to fill one or two of those job positions, it creates a high risk, high potential opportunity for for injury and loss. And um, we were we were truly experiencing that in 2007. Uh, at the end of 2007, early 2008, we saw a uh, slowdown in the economy. We saw a slowdown in, in general work, uh, and subsequently our, we were able to catch up in terms of our employee training, our employee development, and we didn't have the turnover concern. And that, that was a major contributor to, to that immediate drop in, in TRIF rate. And then we, over the next few years, we had a what what I refer to as a plateau, where we were around the four 4.0 range uh, for the next three years, and the the result of that, uh, it was 2011 that we 
recognized that we weren't going to get any better just using a compliance-based model for our health and safety program. We had to be doing more. We had to change something in our process. And in, uh, in the fall of 2011, we approached CAP Safety to provide us with a safety perception survey um, and subsequently implemented several um, uh, steer, well, a steering team and several continuous improvement teams focused on very specific uh, em- employee-generated concerns, that some of the things that we were most concerned about in our, in our uh, business operations, and that included recognition for uh, work that, that's being done, uh, positive recognition processes and training for supervisors, and it also included um, two other elements, communication being the most notable. Um, communication is a big part of our challenge because of our, our um, structure and we're, what we did find was that in 2011, 2012, we were hitting the send button on emails and anticipating instant and, and consistent reaction and, uh, uh, and that wasn't occurring obviously. So that's uh, that's a bit of a summary that's got us to our journey here in 2014. We're currently uh, at the two or just under the two range in our year-to-date TRIF, um, and and uh, major focus at the supervisory level on on uh, guidance, support, and and daily <laughs> excuse me daily communication with all staff members. Sure. Tim, what's the uh, industry average for um, your primary line of business? Do you know that offhand? Well, for for the 2013 year, it's about 3.3. Um, mm-hmm. Basically, where we were at within the compliance model, uh, going back to 2009, 10, and 11. And and it, it's interesting you ask that. Um, it's it's not uh, in the Canadian market. It's not easy to determine if you're comparing apples to apples in terms of, of reporting structures, but we are, mm-hmm. uh, you know, from what we've seen and in, in, in reviewing with uh, WCB and a couple of the other uh, agencies, we're in in consistently 35 to 40% lower than uh, our, our competitors in the, in the marketplace or our other industries in the similar market. Okay. Thank you very much. So, you know, one thing that Tim and I, you know, we've talked about is, you know, some things that are common in safety. And, uh, you know, this this won't be any new revelation to anybody here, but just a few things that, um, you know, what we know about safety. You know, first off, every organization has a safety program. Um, you know, you, you can't survive without a program that has the policies and procedures and, you know, covers your basic compliance requirements. Uh, but... Uh, although you may have some of the best policies and procedures, you might have uh, reams of three-ring binders on the shelf that uh, detail exactly what people are to do and how to do it and um, how to work. That doesn't necessarily always translate out into the field uh, in the way that uh, one would expect. And so uh, employees have to uh, be involved in helping create that program. They, uh, you have to have all levels that are participating in developing those programs. The other thing is that uh, you know every organization has a safety culture. Uh, it's just uh, not every organization has a culture of safety, and there's a difference there. Um, a culture of safety is one in which where it's been you know fully integrated and embedded into the organization. Safety is just part of what you do. Um, you know we have yet to really see an organization that can't improve their culture around safety and therefore improve their safety performance. And we'll, we'll talk about how you improve culture when it, uh, specifically to safety. We also know that every organization does have some pain or challenges when it comes to managing safety. Uh, from our experience, we typically find that organizations are challenged in three areas. One would be that they have executives or managers that uh, haven't bought into safety or not fully committed to safety, and oftentimes that's because they're not really sure of what their role is when it comes to managing and leading safety. Uh, traditionally, it's we hired a safety director and it's their job to manage safety. And so 
they're not fully um, aware of what it is that they need to do. Uh, second area that we find a lot of organizations challenged with is supervisors that are you know, sending the wrong message or perhaps the mix uh, or a mixed message about safety. And, you know, sometimes it's very unintentional in, in the way they uh, do that. Perhaps it's a conversation with uh, the employees on the shop floor or in the field talking about um, uh, maybe there's production issues, we're behind schedule, and maybe at the end they say, well, you know, make sure you don't get hurt. Well, what the employees hear is, you know, get the job done. Or perhaps uh, supervisors recognize and or reward employees for getting a job done, you know, on time, under budget, uh, but not knowing that they committed a lot of at-risk behaviors to get that done. So unintentionally, they might reinforce those at-risk behaviors. Uh, the last area that we see organizations that um, you know, tend to be challenges, challenged in is with employees that really don't feel that safety is their responsibility. And that's because safety typically for you know has been pushed from the top down rather than uh, involving the employees from the bottom and help having them uh, develop the processes or provide input and so they feel that hey it's someone else's job um, you just tell us what to do we've never been involved in actually creating what this looks like um, and lastly every organization has to manage safety um, you know that's just <laughs> That's the reality of it, there, and there's various reasons why you have to manage safety. One is there's a legal obligation, um, whether it's OSHA, MSHA, DOT, or, you know, for Tim, up in Canada, they've got their own set of uh, agencies that oversee safety. There's a financial reason behind it. Um, safety is good business. In today's world, uh, safety has become much more important when it comes to securing work, especially in the business that I came from. With uh, contracting, uh, you're going up against similar companies, and if their safety performance is better, you may lose out. And lastly, and I think what is the most important reason for it's the right thing to do um, from a moral standpoint. Uh, we care about our employees; they are our most important uh, asset and resource. So, why wouldn't we want to keep them safe? Anything you want to add to that, Tim? No, just uh, well, in in relation to the uh, the employee commitment and and you know using the employees' feedback, one of the comments that came back that hits right on uh, with our what our previous culture was, we had a um, by virtue of the type of business we're in as a rental supplier, an implied sense of urgency that went through the organization, and what this did. Um, it, un, unknowingly at first, but what it did was it put a burden on our frontline people who have very little um, control over the circumstances, and, and it, it put them in a position where either the sales rep or the customer or the the uh, customer support contact has identified that this piece of equipment needs to get to the customer right away. Hurry up, drop everything, make it happen. And that implied sense of urgency uh, actually cost us caused us loss and, and cost us money and and uh, injury to our workforce. And once we recognized that, it became a more consistent, uh, reinforceable message to our supervisors and through to the work frontline workers. And your you know, your comments about the pain it comes that comes from it, we didn't realize as a management team what that implied sense of urgency was doing to our uh, to our workforce. So it's it's interesting when you start asking the right questions of your workforce, the feedback you're going to get. Back to you, Zach. Thanks. And so there's a lot of different ways in which organizations approach uh, managing safety, and, and these are just a few, and there's other ways. These are some of the traditional ones. Um, luck, you know, hope that nobody gets hurt uh, is probably one of the worst ways that you could approach uh, safety. Um, you know, we certainly do not manage production and quality based on, I hope we produce enough product this year, or I hope we make enough money. We have very specific plans in place on how we're going to do that. So why would safety be managed any differently? Um, Compliance-based approaches, you know, here's, here's the rules. Um, what the government wants is what we'll do. Um, the issue with that is, uh, although we do need to focus on the, the rules and regulations, 
Um, if you look at what causes most incidents, um, 90% of incidents are the result of behaviors, and, and 10% is a result of conditions. So if you are compliance-based, uh, you're going to be focusing uh, the majority of your time on 10% of the incidents, and um, obviously you're going to be missing the 90%, which is uh, the at-risk behaviors. And so that's not going to get you to where you want to be. Another traditional approach is the kind of the, the enforcement, uh, you know, side of things. Uh, if you break the rules, uh, we're going to punish you, the blame game. Um, you know, we tend to focus on the employee and not really on what influenced that employee's behavior. And if you look at it, um, typically those behaviors are driven by organizational and cultural related issues, which are really a function of management and leadership. And so, again, you're going to be missing the big picture if all you do is uh, enforce the rules. Another approach is where uh, we delegate uh, all things safety to the safety team person, or maybe it's a group of people, and uh, it's their job to ensure that nobody gets hurt. Well, obviously, uh, that is not what we would want. Uh, you need to have all people involved in, in being responsible for safety. When safety manages safety, a couple things happen. Uh, first of all, the program uh, that you have in place is going to be largely influenced by what those safety people know or what they're comfortable with. Or maybe it's um, going to be influenced by what their boss likes. And that may not necessarily be what's right for the organization or what is um, needed for the employees. And so that has to be a shared responsibility for all people within the organization, not just safety. And then lastly, uh, reactionary. Um, you know, this obviously can be the result of any of the above. So you can run out of luck, and when you run out of luck, you're going to react to that in some form or fashion. Uh, if it's compliance-based, you might get OSHA inspection or uh, some agency gives you some citations, and so you react to those things. Um, on the enforcement side, what tends to be the reaction is somebody, you know, eventually gets hurt doing a job a certain way, and uh, we react by punishing them. Now, as long as nobody gets hurt, we sometimes tend to uh, turn a blind eye to it, but uh, you know, organizations don't want to uh, uh, not punish somebody, but oftentimes they tend to overlook those things uh, unless somebody does get hurt. So sometimes it's just, you know, someone's made a made an example of unfairly. Speaking of reaction um, and reacting to accidents, uh, one of our models is this traditional incident reaction cycle. And if you've been on any of our other webinars, you've probably seen this in the past. But, you know, an incident occurs within your organization, or perhaps it's a rash of ex incidents, you know, uh, what are we going to do? Well, management has to react to that, and we want management to react because uh, that indicates that they care. Oftentimes, um, the way they react, though, is by doing uh, more of the same and expecting different results, which, you know, that would be the definition of insanity. So uh, the key here is when we do react to incidents, we got to figure out what are the activities that are going to make a difference, and how do we... Uh, ingrain those within the DNA of the organization so that when we move forward, we don't go back to business as usual and just keep repeating this cycle. And so we'll be talking a little bit about ways in which you can do that. So I, I kind of talked about, uh, you know, mentioned incidents um, and, and talked about that. You know, 90% of incidents are really uh, driven by these at-risk behaviors, not necessarily conditions. And, and so this is where we're going to talk about, well, how does incidents and behaviors, how does that um, connect to culture? And so the question is, why do employees commit these at-risk behaviors? Is it that they show up for work and say, you know, hey, today's my day to get hurt? Um, I would guess that most of you would say, no, that's that's not what your employees do. There's something that is influencing those behaviors. And I shared the example of, um, you know, some, maybe it's some of the messaging that we 
uh, unintentionally deliver. Perhaps it's an employee working out in the field, and the policy is you need to be wearing your face shield while using a grinder, and a supervisor or manager walks by and sees them not wearing it. The employee sees that manager, and they just walk right by and don't say anything. So the message they send to the employees is that, hey, it's okay. You don't need to wear your um, face shield. And so it's these attitudes and beliefs and ideas that they have, and, and sometimes these are uh, attitudes that they bring uh, with them from a former employee, player, or just maybe they have a higher level of risk tolerance. But a lot of these are driven by the norms, the unwritten rules within your organization, which are a product of the culture. And you know what we have found over you know our you know, many years of uh, working with organizations is that the majority of incidents, if you do your uh, root cause analysis, they will tend to lead back to some cultural or uh, norms within your organization that are driving these certain attitudes that employees have that lead to these at-risk behaviors. So if we focus on uh, changing the culture, uh, establishing norms that say the only way we work is you know, the safe way, employees start to see that, it changes their attitudes and beliefs, they will commit fewer at-risk behaviors, and then therefore you should have fewer incidents. Zach, just on that, uh, you know, the example I gave earlier is a, is a perfect uh, demonstration of how this played out in our world where uh, the rental industry had a belief or had a, uh, a desire to perform at a higher level and it meant hurry up and rush on everything you do rather than do it to do it correctly once the first time. And just by changing that dynamic, um, we're seeing a... A, a better response from our workforce, and and certainly, uh, it's a shift in culture that that over time it hasn't completely embedded itself in our organization, but we fully expect by by clearly defining what the scope of the task is, uh, we're going to be more effective in our relationship with our customer and reduce the potential uh, risk for for our workforce. And just just by managing the at-risk behaviors more effectively, uh, and and empowering the uh, the worker uh, to make some decisions that that provide them with a safe alternative. Yeah, and that was uh, very similar to contracting business too. Um, you know, as as a project was nearing the end of its uh, you know deadline, or maybe it's uh, you're butting up against the winter season. There's this uh, sense of pressure that uh, superintendents feel, and it gets kind of uh, it filters down to the employees to work faster and harder. And uh, you sometimes, you know, that's where I saw a lot of our struggles was later in the season where we had incidents because uh, the behaviors changed um, due to some of the, maybe the norms um, uh, shifting a little bit. So, uh, you know, Tim and I, you know, we kind of looked at what are some of the challenges to managing safety across multiplications? And there's a whole host of them. You know, Tim, already talked about geography being one, and, and obviously uh, that was a huge challenge for us as well, um, looking at the, you know, you've got uh, projects spread throughout uh, an area, and, you know, you've got a safety person that's trying to get to all these different projects, and so, you know, we had to come up with a better way of how do we manage safety at all these different locations. Um, you know, one size does not always fit all, so... Uh, sometimes there's a thought that, you know, here's here's the programs, here's the policies, here's the book, you know, go forward and implement it and, you know, it'll be perfect. Um, but I think we have to realize that uh, every operation or every organization has different subcultures, uh, different workforce, and so you have to have some flexibility built into your system as well. Um, Acquisitions, organic growth, we've already talked about some of the challenges there. Uh, decentralized versus centralized. You know, if you're a very decentralized organization, then you really have to focus on the leadership with each of those locations. Um, from a centralized standpoint, you know, if you've got a CEO or someone that can deliver a clear vision and, and, and take that through their management team throughout all the locations, that uh, can be very effective. Uh, union, non-union, um, what, what I've experienced is, um, although it, it can be a challenge, I've also found that if you uh, involve 
union and non-union uh, workers in helping to develop uh, the solutions, a lot of the issues uh, with the, the that relationship tend to just disappear because they are now part of uh, the the process, part of the system, rather than being you know told what to do. Um, too many needs for available resources. I think we've all probably experienced that, um, where you know there's just a lack of maybe it's people. Um, and so one way in which you can overcome that, you know, if you're a safety professional and, you, you know, from a staffing standpoint is um, what we did is we really focused on developing our supervisors and managers to be safety leaders in the field. And uh, so that way, you know, you didn't have to have a safety person at every single job, but we had competent people at those jobs. Anything you want to add to that, Tim? No, I think I think you pretty well covered it. Um, you know, insofar as uh, the, the resources in our in our experience, you never have enough resources if you allow uh, or if you want the safety department to you know to be present on every site. Uh, it does have to be grassroots and and in the workforce. And I think that was one of the larger uh, dynamic changes that that we've had had experience with is. Uh, Who's got the accountability for what elements within safety? Mm -hmm. So uh, I want to introduce a person. His name is Dr. Dan Peterson. Uh, he um, was a um, you know, Ph.D. industrial psychologist. He worked with organizations throughout the world. Uh, a lot of his work um, we have you know, built our models around here at Caterpillar Safety Services. And, um, you know, one of the things he said in one of the many books he wrote is it's the culture, not the elements that determine safety success. So, in other words, you can have the best policies, procedures um, in place and, and written, but if the culture doesn't support that, then you're not going to achieve the success that you're, you're looking for. So, how is it that you influence or change culture? And what Dr. Peterson found was that uh, although there's no one single right way to manage safety, uh, he found that those organizations that achieved excellence in safety, so you know, the best of the best, they had these six criteria in place within their organizations. And these are criteria that you can use to really evaluate uh, not only your organization as a whole, but to evaluate your individual locations, you know, if they each have their own leadership and management um, structure, you can use this to evaluate, you know, where are they at. So the first one, and most importantly, is top management has to be visibly committed. Uh, it has to be more than just top management supporting safety, but we, uh, we talk about visibly demonstrating that support. And so what would that look like? Um, I'll, I'll share some examples when I get into you know, what our organization uh, did in that regards. Middle management has to be actively involved. They need to be doing two things. So if you look at your middle managers, are they participating in uh, activities around safety at some frequency? And secondly, are they holding those people that report to them accountable for safety? If safety is holding supervisors accountable for safety, uh, then, you know, you're missing a key uh, step there. Middle managers have to be holding their, uh, their folks accountable, not the safety person. Your supervisors, they should not be uh, measured against, you know, did we have accidents or not. Uh, they should be measured based upon the things that they have control of, and so those would be uh, activities that they can conduct, whether it's... Um, you know, in the field, in the shop, or whatever it is that they do. Uh, employees, and we've talked about this, uh, they have to be actively participating. If they're on the sidelines and not uh, in the game, uh, they lose interest, and um, it's not uh, positively perceived, which is the sixth criteria. Um, you have to have some flexibility throughout your uh, organization. Each location may do things a little bit different. Um, you know, maybe the, the framework is the same for all, but within that framework, they have some flexibility to do things based upon their unique culture that they have in place. 
Uh, okay, moving on. Unless Tim, you want to add anything to that? No, nope, let's uh, let's move it forward. Right. So there's various tools and processes that um, you can use to um, change the culture. Uh, so we talked about, you know, what is what does a good culture look like? What do you have to have in place? These are some of the tools and processes for actually managing safety, um, based upon our experience. <clears throat> Uh, you know, most organizations, uh, you know, at some point you start at these level one type tools and processes, and uh, this is kind of a foundational for all organizations. You know, something happens, you have to have things that you do that react to it. So you have compliance, uh, you react to the compliance uh, regulations, you have investigation process in place, you have safety meetings that you hold regularly. Uh, level two tools are more about getting out and starting to see what's happening within your um, operation. So this might be an observation program, uh, job hazard analysis, job safety analysis, inspection process in place. It's starting to look for the hazards, identify them, correct them before that results in an injury. Level one and level two, these are foundational. Most organizations should have these type of things in place, but if that's all you have, that's all you're doing, you're probably going to have fairly high incident rates or ones that you're not satisfied with. Level three, uh, this is really where you start to develop accountability systems within those level one and level two tools. So it's defining clear expectations around your job hazard analysis program. It's providing training on how to do a good job hazard analysis. It's measuring how often do we do them um, from a quantity standpoint, but also looking at from a quality standpoint, are we doing effective ones or are we pencil whipping them? And then lastly, with the accountability system, it's recognizing our people for doing those activities well, just like we would recognize them for meeting their production goals and uh, having you know high level quality with their work. It's kind of the, the key area that most organizations really struggle with is developing these uh, accountability systems within the level one and level two tools. Uh, level four, what we believe, it's really about um, getting the feedback from your employees. What are the issues out there? Um, they tend to have the best picture of what's happening within the organization because they're the ones closest to the hazards, and they will tell you, hey, we yes, we have a job hazard analysis program, but it's not working. Um, you know, it's being pencil whipped. And so their feedback is critical. Once you have their feedback, you can really engage your employees uh, with uh, level five type tools, uh, you know, safety teams, continuous improvement teams, and um, level six is how we lead. So if you get some data on what's going on with your organization, you can engage your employees, you can help have your employees develop these accountability systems for the level one and level two processes. And it's really a model that works quite well within any industry. And it's it's a very good reference point to go back uh, and reflect on at various times in your in your business cycle uh, for, as a management tool. You know what are we are we hovering around four or are we up to the five range? Are we doing more things successfully? And I, uh, I really applaud the, the the format, the simplicity of it. It makes uh, certainly makes my job a little bit easier when I start evaluating where do I put my energies and and our uh, managers' energies. Yep, it's a great tool for you to take out and again evaluate your organization, evaluate those locations that uh, you have out there, and say are they a level one, are they a two and a half, where are they at, and what do they need to do to get to level six. You combine that with the six criteria for safety excellence, you've got two really um, simple models to look at to evaluate. And the hard part is, you know, uh, creating change, but it can be done. This here is just kind of a simple measurement model, uh, you know, in, in, in ways in which organizations tend to look at safety and manage safety. So on the left-hand side, you can see the usefulness. Uh, there's a scale that says usefulness creates action, and on the bottom it has various levels of organization. So a lot of organizations focus on lagging indicators, the results. Uh, did anybody get hurt or not? So your incident rates. That is very useful to uh, upper levels of management because they look at that and say, well, hey, our numbers look good. Now, looking at that from the frontline worker as you drive to the right, that becomes um, less meaningful to them 
most employees really don't care what the incident rate is of your organization. They don't know what it means. They just want to make sure, hey, I want to get home safely each and every day. What is this organization doing to ensure that happens? What's more effective for the frontline worker is actually doing the activities. You know, what, what are the steps, what are the processes that we have in place to ensure that people don't get hurt? Uh, but as you go to the left um, on your x-axis there, you can see that upper levels of management tend to be disconnected to those activities, and they don't really know what's going on in the field. And so it's more useful for one but less for the other. So what's the right approach? is really to uh, combine, you know, looking at lagging indicators also with let's get some data, some diagnostics, let's engage our employees, let's create these very robust accountabilities, the right ones, um, and maybe it's only a handful, and then let's connect those activities to all levels of organization so that senior, the senior vice president, division manager has a connection to those activities. And that's kind of what... Uh, you know, most organizations should be aiming for when it comes to managing safety is this combination of lagging indicators and activities that produce leading indicators. So a little bit about uh, the organization I work for. Uh, like I said, construction materials, heavy, heavy civil contractor, kind of similar to the, the, the journey that uh, Tim was on as well. We were not amongst the best. 13% um, of our workforce was being injured back in 1999. Uh, focused a lot on the symptoms to the problems, not necessarily the problems, which were, you know, our system, leadership, and management, but uh, just by getting out and looking at conditions and being active in the, the workplace, the numbers came down rapidly uh, until about 2004. As we started to mature, we really started to look in, you know, in the mirror, what do we need to do better? And one of the things we looked at was Who's got the most influence with our frontline employees? And that was our supervisors. And we realized that many of our supervisors were uh, promoted from, you know, the, the asphalt paving crew, from the, the, the crushing crew. They're the best at their job, and they got the supervisor hat. What we failed to do was provide them with good leadership training in, in regards to safety. We said, hey, make sure nobody gets hurt. Uh, you know, you know the rules and regulations. And uh, so we failed our supervisors, and that's when we implemented some supervisory training. We got uh, a new CEO that came on board in 2005, and he created a vision for our organization, um, our eight regions, our 22 divisions that we had out there, and said, you know, this is what we want to do. This is what we're going to achieve. And that had a profound effect um, and a ripple throughout our entire organization. Then we, uh, we did a, a survey to collect some data, and then we started engaging our employees, and we took ownership of this process. And so I'll talk a little bit about that so moving forward here. So one of the first things we did was establish a foundation throughout our entire organization. That foundation was really built upon a program called START, which stands for Supervisory Training and Accountability and Recognition Techniques. Um, it's, it's an industry-leading program. What we found was that our supervisors just didn't understand what their role is. They didn't um, have good communication skills when it came to safety. It was much more of the traditional model of uh, enforcement and compliance. And so we, we, we had to work on their soft skills. And so this program really helped uh, to develop those supervisors and give them some tools that they could uh, immediately take uh, back to their employees and, and start to implement. You know, what, what it was is really a turning point you know, for our supervisors was we were no longer holding them really accountable for the results, which are, you know, let's make sure nobody gets hurt, um, let's not have any uh, lost time accidents and things like that. And we started focusing on the things that they really had control over um, out in the field. And those were things like, hey, ensure that people are wearing the proper personal protective equipment, make sure that our housekeeping uh, standards are being met, uh, make sure that you do good quality near miss uh, investigations and that you're working with your employees on developing solutions. And so these are the things that our supervisors really have control over, but just weren't given the, the tools and resources to really uh, make that happen. So that was really a turning point for us in um, 
elevating the skill set of our supervisors. Uh, Tim, you just jump in anytime you want to, okay? Breathe. Um, and then, uh, so what do you, what do you stand for? You got to ask yourself, um, what does your organization stand for? You got to create a vision. And uh, our CEO, uh, Bill Schneider at the time, he did create that vision. He said, what I'd really like is for our people to truly believe that we care about them. And that's pretty, um, that's pretty powerful. You know, you have an organization of 5,000 plus employees that he wants them to believe that the organization does care about them. And so what he had to do was demonstrate that to those employees. And um, you can't do that sitting behind a desk um, and just say, yeah, I support safety. The way in which he did that was he put on his calendar frequent uh, location or project visits where he would uh, travel to them, whether it's by plane or car or whatever it is, and he would go out to these projects and, and meet with employees. Uh, they would do a, you know, a safety meeting, and Bill would talk to them and, and hear from them and ask them, you know, what can we do better? Uh, he also uh, made safety part of every one of his messages, whether it was a quarterly uh, board meeting, whether it was a meeting with the executive group. Uh, safety was just part of his conversation. He did a weekly uh, voice-recorded message that would talk about safety and kind of the, the state of the business, and he would send that out to all employees with email addresses. And uh, the other thing that he did was really unique was we ran uh, continuous improvement teams, and he would pick a few throughout the year and show up when these teams reported out on what they developed. And it was uh, quite the experience to have the CEO of the organization be there in front of a group of frontline employees that were uh, reporting out. Just, One uh, of the things that... Uh, Yep. Sorry, uh, just a, a comment. I, our CEO, um, our general manager, has a very similar approach and is, you know, is quite engaged with not just uh, the follow-ups at a branch level, but with individual employees. Um, there, you know, when an employee contributes at a high level, uh, he's recognizing that, uh, and, and as often as he can in a personal face-to-face -face discussion. And uh, we're we're seeing uh, the volunteer from the, the frontline ranks, the volunteer level is escalating for some of the continuous improvement team initiatives we're, we're developing. Uh, we've got, you know, we've got more people volunteering than we can, uh, we can utilize right now, and it's to a large degree because of the executive uh, focus on safety. Excellent. As we went, uh, you know, forward in our journey, we got to a point where we were uh, well below industry average, you know, probably, you know, uh, you know, 40 percent below and the question was asked by the ceo are we good or are we just lucky and that's a it's a great question to ask you know what data do we have that proves we're good um and at that time the only data we really had was lagging indicator data you know the workers compensation uh you know your osha rates and so uh, my response was, well, I think we have pockets of excellence, and I think we have some folks that are um, probably just getting lucky. And so the way in which we addressed that was, you know, if we don't know what's broken, how the heck can we fix it? Um, instead of, you know, throwing a dart at the dartboard and hoping you hit the bullseye, we decided to utilize uh, a safety perception survey. And uh, so we surveyed, you know, 5,000 plus employees across our organization. And what we found was that the lowest scoring areas within our company were these five, um, these five categories. One, you know, recognition for performance. We just were not doing a good job of recognizing our employees for working safely. We were very quick to point out when they messed up, though, and, uh, you know, tell them what they were doing wrong. And so we knew that was a, a an area we had to focus on. We had issues with our operating procedures, either being um, not specific enough, not uh, consistently being um, followed. We had uh, low scores in our awareness programs, in our inspection process, and then we scored low in involving our employees. And so what we had to do was develop a plan in how we were going to tackle uh, these areas. And what we said was, hey, for number five involvement employees, we can involve them in all of the above things and helping us to create the solutions. And so the picture here is a survey that we took, uh, 73 questions, yes, no, 
took our employees 15 to 20 minutes to do and gave us a tremendous amount of data to really start to start develop our strategic and tactical plans moving forward. So we got these results. You know, question is now, now what do you do? Um, we had to start solving the problem. So throughout our organization, we created safety steering teams within each of our divisions. These teams were composed of not, you know, not just the safety person where, hey, here's the data, figure it out. But we had uh, safety, we had frontline employees, we had uh, managers and executive sponsor on these teams that they were responsible for coming up with the action items and the plans. And so ownership for safety started to really um, move through all levels of the organization. You started to get more buy-in with the process. And so what we did was engage the, the organization in developing these solutions. And how we, we did went, that in Tim's... Go ahead, Yeah, Tim. we went through a very similar uh, process. And <clears throat> basically, uh, the, the bottom 10 elements off of the safety perception survey, uh, we, we were very clear in discussing those with our... Uh, with our staff and as we develop the safety steering team and then the uh, the continuous improvement teams, they chose which of the bottom 10 elements were, were most advantageous to approach. And that was, you know, there, there's some expense to doing that. You're bringing people from far reaching corners of the business at all levels and you're having to backfill at the branch while they're working on the committee. Uh, that's part of the management and leadership commitment, and, and it's a very important component to not underplay or undervalue those com committee uh, processes. That's a great point, Tim. Uh, it's not it's not easy doing this, you know, what uh, you know Tim's doing and, and what I was part of, because um, it takes a lot of commitment. Uh, but if it were easy, everybody would be doing it, right? So uh, it definitely a high level of commitment, but the results speak for themselves. So we both talked about these uh, continuous improvement teams um, within our organization, within our first two years of really uh, actively involving our employees. We created over 20 of these continuous improvement teams. This was about anywhere from five to nine uh, employees, uh, mainly frontline employees with some supervisors and executive sponsor, and they uh, either created new processes or approved existing processes. And you can see some of them that they worked on. And we also had a few at the corporate level that we worked on, such as electrical safety and developing a driver training program. And so we had uh, corporate initiatives going on, and then we had location initiatives. And we were able to leverage the the division uh, successes to share with other locations or to say, hey, this would be a great corporate-wide type process that they developed. So we had a lot of positive momentum uh, out of that uh, process. What what these continuous improvement teams, teams do is they ensure when they develop or improve an existing process that they uh, really embed accountability into it. So I already mentioned this, you know, the, the four steps, you know, having clear, defined expectations around those processes, you know, who's going to do what, at what frequency, what's, how are we going to train our people, um, you know, what does the, the frontline worker training look like compared to what does the uh, maybe um, uh, plant manager training look like. They might be different. And they develop the training program. They also developed the measurement systems to ensure uh, ongoing success, you know, looking at both quantity and quality. And they also developed recognition into that uh, process as well. And I've got an example I want to share of a, a process that was uh, improved by a continuous improvement team on toolbox talks or, you know, your weekly safety meeting. And so I kind of uh, highlighted some of the things that um, – each level of the organization was responsible for. So within this uh, particular division, foreman or the supervisor, their job uh, was to prepare for and conduct a weekly meeting. And you can see there's a lot of other things that they have to do there as well. The employee's responsibility is to attend that meeting uh, every week and then to actively participate. As you kind of move up the organization, the safety person had a 
responsibility to attend two meetings per quarter. And during those meetings, they have to include positive recognition um, for what's taking place within that particular group's um, work environment. And so it might be, hey, um, I was out a couple of weeks ago or I was out you know, yesterday or whatever it was, and these are the things that I saw you guys doing well. And so they need to provide that feedback. Uh, middle managers, they have to attend two uh, safety meetings uh, each year. Uh, they have to ask questions about the safety meeting uh, during their regular uh, conversation. So a middle manager would meet with their uh, supervisors and ask them, so how's the safety meetings going? Uh, which employees are speaking up? Uh, what issues are being discussed? How are you engaging them? Senior management also has uh, some defined activities and accountabilities. Uh, you can see here, attend two per year and include positive recognition in their comments and also build uh, conversations around the safety meeting process into their normal business uh, conversation. So just a, a quick example to show how you can connect all levels of organization with these safety activities to ensure that they're being managed just like you manage production and quality. I'm sure that's very similar to what uh, your your folks are doing, Tim. Absolutely, uh, we you know we don't vary very uh, much from what you identified there. Okay. So just kind of in closing here, you know the journey. It's um, definitely one that's um, it's not easy, but it, it's worth the the, the effort. Um, you know, ultimately, what uh, I think every organization wants to do is is foster and create a culture of safety where. Uh, all employees know that um, the only way we do things is safely. And so how do you do that? You really need to create and communicate the vision, uh, whether that vision comes at a, a, a corporate level if you're centralized or each of your locations has you know, a vision and a mission statement as to what they want to achieve. You really need to find out what, what is not working with an organization or, and what is working. Um, to find out what is not working, there's different things you can do. You can do safety perception surveys. You can interview your employees, focus groups, whatever it is. But you need to ask them and, and, and give them the opportunity to tell you what the issues are. Uh, establishing a foundation, I think, is critical, you know, whether it's uh, you know, supervisory, uh, uh, skills training, something that um, puts everybody on a level set as to this is uh, how we manage safety. Engaging your employees in developing the problems, uh, again, um, I think it's, it's critical, oftentimes a missing component when we look at managing safety. And then as you do that and they develop and improve these new processes, you can start to establish your leading metrics around um, those activities and uh, start to complement your lagging metrics that you already have in place. So if you really focus on changing the culture, in the norms, you'll eventually uh, start to really change the behaviors of your workforce as you change their behaviors to one where, you know, this is the way we work and it, it's safely, you'll have fewer incidents. And so uh, the blueprint that I found to be successful, and I think Tim would agree, is uh, really looking at those six criteria for safety excellence. Uh, do we have that in place? Yes or no? What do we need to get there? the six levels of safety, the various um, tools that you can use to drive performance, and then ensuring that you have a strong accountability system uh, around each of the activities that are being done on a daily basis or whatever frequency that you do. And so, again, you know, don't focus just on the results. Um, what you want to do is connect the activities that you have uh, on that are happening uh, out in the workforce to your executives so that they have some tie into it and uh, that's where you'll start to drive uh, safety performance. With that, um, Abby, uh, you know, I'll turn it over to you. Uh, Tim, do you have any closing comments uh, before I do turn it over to Abby though? Uh, no, I think, uh, I think we've pretty much uh, hit the high points and, and absolutely uh, covered what, what we see as core values here. Okay, All well, right, thanks, thanks to both of you, and I know we are just about out of time, but we did have one question come through that I think both of you probably can weigh in on a little bit, and that's to get a little bit more specific maybe with some best practices around 
recognition uh, for, for good performance and kind of what that looks like. Is it just verbal? Uh, does it involve an actual reward? Should it be formal or informal? You know, what are your recommendations around that uh, based on what you've seen work well? Um, for just Tim here, from my perspective, uh, there, there's several key elements. Uh, the recognition has to happen when you witness it. It needs to be timely. Um, it needs needs to be uh, consistent. And and you know most most employees are are struggling with um, what do they need to do correctly and we we're awful good at criticizing and showing them what we don't like you know we'll we'll reprimand somebody at the drop of a hat so we just change that perspective a little bit provide a more uh, consistent guidance and uh, and and make it meaningful make sure that the employee understands that he's adding value to the organization and he's doing it safely and and for that we're we're uh pleased with his performance and and you know he's he's um, doing the right thing yeah, that, exactly. And you have to go beyond the, the trash and trinkets approach um, where, you know, you give people a hat or um, whatever it is at the end of the year for, you know, no injuries. Um, it really has to be more sincere than that. And, and that takes uh, coaching and training of supervisors and managers. And, and oftentimes um, it's hard to do, although it's um, it seems simple. Uh, we're we're so focused on catching people doing things wrong that uh, sometimes you have to be very intentional and you have to put it on your calendar that well, I'm go I'm going to go out and recognize employees for what they do well and make it uh, very meaningful. But we what we have found and what I have found um, in, in working with the organization I came from was that recognizing someone on the spot uh, is much more powerful. And, and much more of a motivational tool um, than you know providing them with uh, you know some reward and uh, but it does take some skills training to do and um, what we have found is that you can embed recognition into a lot of the activities and processes that you have in place so if you have a safety meeting um, there are ways in which you can recognize employees now you have to understand the you know, do you recognize someone in front of their peers or not? Um, oftentimes, the one-on-one uh, -on -one recognition seems to be the preferred method for most employees. And so it's just understanding uh, some of those things that um, really make the recognition uh, most meaningful to them. And, it, it you know, the, just one other closed comment on that. It needs to be... Uh occurring quite regularly uh, in fact you know you may you may have to work with an employee four or five or six times before you start getting them actually performing at the level you're you're looking for using a recognition process um, and and it's it's a it's a more personal approach that seems to be most successful with our supervisor group and just as exactly as Zach uh, indicated the the one-on-one -on -one, um, is quite often more meaningful and uh, uh, more of a, a benefit to the employee than uh, the group, you know, attaboy. And, and while that has its time and place, it's not, it's not the one you need to rely on. Okay, thanks, guys. And, and while you were answering that question, we had a couple of questions come in that are they're hit, hitting on the same point and about how uh, you would recommend employees communicate up the chain if they have concerns about safety. So the first is, how do you suggest communicating the message to an executive team who are not fully engaged in the common goal? And the, and the next and related question, I think, is, as a lower-level worker, how would one go about telling management that they are falling behind on their side of safety? Well, that's a great, great question there, um, and, and that can be very challenging for, you know, say, a frontline employee to... Uh, uh, address that uh, how uh, we were able to um, help in, in that regards was I mentioned these safety steering teams this is different than say a safety committee uh, but the safety steering teams which had representation uh, from frontline employees and supervisors they became kind of the the voice for the organization and it was um, those folks had a um, kind of an obligation to kind of what's the pulse of the organization 
and provided a, a channel to employees to say, hey, you know, we developed these, uh, this new process and we, we're talking these things, but it's not happening. And so the, the safety steering team was able to then uh, go to the, uh, whether it's the executive group or say, listen, we're not um, meeting the accountabilities that have been established or we're not walking the talk. We've got some folks just delivering lip service. And so that was um, one way of doing it. The other way was, uh, you know, through developing some, you know, foundational a foundational platform like, you know, when we use the START program, that helped our supervisor really understand their role. And as they um, were able to improve their skill set, they became much more open to receiving feedback from employees because they they understood their role in, in being an effective leader. And so the supervisor was able then to communicate uh, to their manager up the chain that uh, we have some issues. And um, so that was uh, two different ways in which uh, we were able to address that. Yeah, I, I wouldn't disagree. I think uh, you, you have to uh, be willing to accept the, as a supervisor manager, be able to accept um, the comments that are being made by the, the staff, quantify them as, as valid, and then uh, respond back to them in, in a clear, open fashion. Um, and, and I think that's where it broke down on our side of the fence. Uh, historically, it was we, we were hearing through employee opinion surveys and through some of the feedback loops we had, we were hearing that there was uh, some dissension or some concern about our commitment as management team. And, uh, you know, we, need, we needed to stand up and actually take accountability for the, uh, for the actions that, that were outlined and, and you know, uh, be measurable. Basically, and I think that's that goes back to some of the uh, the core principles we spoke about earlier. Um, if each level of the organization truly understands and is well trained in terms of what their accountabilities are towards safety and towards the the communication of the messages, uh, it becomes an easier process when it does start to fall down because others in the group now have a channel to to call you on it. Okay, thanks so much uh, to both of you. And with that, we're going to go ahead and wrap up. We have gone over a little bit, but thanks to all of you who stayed on the line to hear the responses to the questions. That's all the questions that came through during the event, but should you have any uh, additional questions or comments for our presenters, please feel free to reach out to us at that email address on the screen now, safetyservices at cat.com. That comes to me, and I would be happy to share whatever feedback or questions you have for Zach and for Tim uh, with those guys. So thanks again uh, to our presenters. Fabulous job today. And I want to remind everyone on the line that we do have these webinar events monthly. Our next one will be on August 13th. And the topic for that one will be fatigue risk management. So uh, thanks again to everybody for joining us, and I hope you all have a great day. Bye-bye.